Hello and welcome to a new Envato Tuts Plus course. I'm Adi Pordila and in this course you'll learn everything you need to know about working in Sketch. Sketch is one of the top apps professional use for uh, UI and icon design. Ever since version 3 it has been a worthy replacement for Adobe Photoshop which many people used uh, to design user interfaces. Since then Sketch has matured into a complete solution for the professional designer, offering a plethora of features designed to simplify the typical design workflow of individuals and teams alike. Now, I've been an early adopter of Sketch, uh, and moving away from Adobe Photoshop for the kind of work that I do was definitely a good decision, even though there are similar apps that um, basically allow you to do the same thing as Sketch apps like Adobe XD, Figma, and Vision Studio, uh, I still find myself uh, reaching for Sketch in most cases. Now, this course is quite lengthy, so here's how we'll structure it. In the first chapter, we'll cover the Sketch fundamentals. We'll do a quick tour of the interface. We'll discuss about pages, artboards, groups, layers, and more. In the second chapter, we'll get into the more advanced functionality and discuss some of the really awesome time-saving features like shared styles, libraries, and symbols. Now, Sketch has some uh, great prototyping features, and we'll cover those in Chapter 3. In Chapter 4, we'll talk about how you can collaborate with other people using features like Sketch Cloud, Sketch for Teams, and we'll also learn about the exporting capabilities in Sketch. Finally, in the last chapter, we'll cover the plugin system for Sketch. All right, we have a lot to cover, so let's begin with the basics. In the next lesson, we'll take a closer look at Sketch, uh, learn where you can get it and what it can do. See you there. Welcome to the first lesson in this course. Now, what is Sketch? Where can you get it? And what can it do? How much does it cost? Who is it for? These are all questions we'll be answering in this lesson. Sketch is a digital design app for creating, prototyping, and collaborating. Now, despite popular belief, Sketch is not just made for designing websites. Most people use it for that, but in reality, with Sketch, you can design any kind of user interface. Either we're talking uh, mobile apps, web apps, you name it. And because Sketch is a vector-based app, you can also use it to create icons and illustrations. Now, to get Sketch, you can go to sketch.com. This is the official website. A couple of things you need to know. Sketch is Mac only, so it only works on Mac OS. Now, we all know Macs are a bit more on the expensive side when it comes to PCs, but the app is actually pretty well optimized, so you don't need a very powerful computer to run it. In fact, what I have here is an early 2013 MacBook Pro, and we all know laptops are not like the most powerful machines, but still on this machine, on this computer, Sketch works just fine, even uh, on large documents with multiple pages, multiple artboards, it still works just fine. Now, Sketch is a paid product, and you do have the option to get a free trial. The trial will work for 30 days, and as you can see at the time of this recording, it requires macOS High Sierra, which is 10.13.4, or newer, of course. Now, if you want to buy the app, it will cost $99. And that gives you one year of updates and one year of Sketch Cloud. After that, first year, you can still use Sketch. 
So you don't have to pay every year. But the thing is, uh, you won't be able to install the new updates. So you'll be stuck with the maximum version that you got in that uh, paid year. Now, if you want to renew an existing license, so if you want to benefit from the continuing updates, you will pay $69 per year. So this is actually pretty good if you think about how other pieces of software used to work in the past, like the Adobe Suite, where you would have to pay a monthly fee to access their apps. Um, Sketch is actually a one-time payment if you don't need those continuing updates. But even if you do, it's a one-time payment each year, which, you know, $69 for a designer or maybe a freelancer or maybe someone who works within a company uh, is not that much. It's uh, it's actually a very accessible price. Uh, I do know there are apps out there like Adobe XD, Figma, those are free. Uh, but, you know, Sketch is actually a pretty complex app. So it's not like you're paying for things that you don't need, you're actually paying for some pretty advanced features, uh, which we'll um, touch on uh, in the rest of this course. So if you have a Mac computer and you're looking for a brilliant piece of software, to be honest, then Sketch is the way to go. Now, who is it for? Well, first and foremost, it's for web designers, right? The whole feature set of creating, prototyping, collaborating, it's uh, designed for these kind of, for, uh, or for this kind of professionals. Uh, you can also use it for app design. So if you want to design an app for iOS or Android, you can use Sketch no problem. And actually, Sketch has certain features that will help you with that. For example, you can create artboards with predefined sizes for uh, various devices, either devices running iOS or running Android. Also, when you export assets, and this is something we'll be talking about towards the end of the course, there are certain presets, again, made especially for or specifically for iOS and Android. You can uh, select an icon, for example, and with one click, you, you can export it in multiple sizes for the various types of uh, devices. And that is very, very cool. Uh, icon designers can also use Sketch for their work. Uh, because Sketch is a vector-based app and not raster-based like Photoshop, Creating icons is really simple. Uh, illustrators can also use it, although it's not as complex as, say, Adobe Illustrator. For simple things, it works just fine, but the more complex the illustration, the more you'll find that a dedicated app is uh, the better choice. Now, if for some reason you're still using Adobe Photoshop for the kind of work that I mentioned previously, uh, you might find that Sketch is actually a very compelling alternative, provided, of course, you're using a Mac computer. If you want to learn more about Sketch versus Adobe Photoshop or Sketch versus Adobe XD, we've covered those topics separately here on Tots Plus, so make sure you check out the links in the lesson notes. All right, now that we got a little bit of a taste on uh, what is Sketch and what you can do with it, let's start going into more detail. And we'll do that in the next lesson uh, by taking a quick tour of the user interface. See you there. Now that we know how to download Sketch, let's open it up and do a quick tour of the user interface. So here it is. This is how it looks like when you create a new document. Notice we have a nice dark theme that can actually be switched to a light theme. If we go to the sketch preferences, you'll see that our appearance currently has the system default, but we can change it manually from here. Or we can leave it on system default and it's going to change automatically 
when we change our operating system theme from light to dark. That's uh, actually a pretty cool addition. Now, there are a couple of elements we need to get familiar with in Sketch. First, on the top, we have the toolbar. This is where we can put our most used tools. And we also have some uh, contextual controls that will become active or inactive depending on the selection we make. This toolbar is customizable. We can right click at any time and select from three different view modes. And by clicking customize toolbar, we can drag the default set like this, or we can manually add new items in here. So for example, if I wanted this uh, triangle tool in my toolbar, I can simply click here and drag it onto my toolbar in any position I want. So that's very nice. You can also customize this by adding spaces and flexible spaces. And when you're done, click this button, and you now have an updated toolbar. On the left side, we have the Pages panel and the Layers panel. Currently, we don't have any layers, but once we populate our artboard, let me quickly show you. Once we populate the artboard with uh, elements, a new layer will automatically be created for that element. And within this Layers panel, we can right click on a layer. We have several options for it. And we can also hide or show that particular element. Up top, we have the Pages panel, which allows us to add new pages, customize or delete existing ones. We'll cover pages and layers in a future lesson. On the right side, we have the Inspector. Now, the Inspector will actually present contextual information depending on our selection. So if, for example, I'm selecting this rectangle shape, I have a specific set of options I can modify. Position, width, height, border radius. I can choose opacity, and then I can define different styles like fill color, border color, border options. I can apply shadows, inner shadows, and blurs. And I can also use this panel to make a specific item exportable. Now, if I were to add a text element, I would have slightly different options. As you can see here, we now have access to text properties like font family, weight, font size, text alignment, and so on. So that's what I mean when it's when I say it's a contextual panel. It depends on what is selected in my canvas. And that brings us to the biggest part right here in the middle. This is called the infinite canvas. And I say infinite because, well, there is no limit to how many elements you can put in here. The canvas will expand as much as you need it to and it's able to accommodate a lot of elements. By default, you cannot change any of the properties for the canvas, right? So if you don't have anything selected here, the inspector is actually empty. You can modify certain properties for the canvas from the sketch preferences. If you open them up by going to sketch preferences, you can see canvas, it has sketch default, but you can cho uh, choose a light canvas or you can choose a dark canvas, depending on your preference. For me, I just leave both of these on system default. So whenever I switch my theme in my OS from light to dark, the app gets updated automatically and I don't have to worry about anything. And that's a quick tour of the user interface. All right, so now that we got familiar with the Sketch UI, Let's um, go into more detail on each of these tools and features. We'll start in the next lesson with pages and artboards. See you there.
there are lots of ways you can organize your sketch files and pages and artboards are two of the best ones so let's learn more about these let's begin with artboards an artboard is a collection of elements within your infinite canvas so instead of designing your web page by simply um, creating elements in the infinite canvas what you can do is grab the artboard tool or a on the keyboard and you can click and drag an artboard of the desired size and you can see this also has a special icon in the layers panel now when you put elements inside that artboard they are contained within so the artboard acts like a parent to these children elements i'm just gonna create two random elements and as you can see in the layers panel those are contained within the artboard so if i delete the artboard those elements will be deleted as well and when i move the artboard my elements move with it so that's very very good now when creating artboards you have the option to either drag an artboard at the size you want and as you can see on the right bottom side of my cursor sketch shows me a preview of my uh, final dimensions in pixels or if you want a little bit more control you can choose from presets now these presets are divided in these categories so we have apple devices and you have artboards for all the latest iphone and ipad and apple watch sizes or we have access to some uh, common android phone sizes we can choose responsive web and we'll get some presets for mobile tablet desktop and desktop hd and on the right side of each you'll find the uh, dimension and pixels we also have some paper sizes starting from a0 all the way to a6 and letter size if we choose responsive web and we click tablet that will automatically create an artboard at that particular size and it's going to name it tablet if we want to rename this simply double click here and enter whatever name you want for that artboard now when you have an artboard selected you can always change its dimension either by using these handles that you'll find in every corner and on every middle on each side so top right left bottom and so on or you can hover with your mouse cursor here and just go left or right after you click or and sketch is actually pretty smart about this you can do numer numerical operations within these boxes so if you want to add like maybe 120 pixels you can just say plus 120 and sketch will automatically calculate that it also works with subtraction so let's say minus 50 and you can even do multiplication and division it works just as well you can change the orientation by basically swapping the width with the height by clicking this button so it goes from portrait to landscape and if at any point you want to go back to a preset simply select that from um, this drop box here on any artboard you can change the background color by default it's white but you can check this box and you can add whatever background color you want and you also have the option to include it in export so if you export the entire artboard do you want to include this background color well if so make sure this box is checked otherwise it won't be included now there is no limit to how many artboards you can have on your canvas you can create as many as you want with any size that you want and this is actually very helpful 
for a number of use cases. For example, when you're creating a website, you can have an artboard for the home page, an artboard for the about page, one for the blog page, and so on. Or maybe you have a page here that's called home page, and you want to have different iterations for that home page. So version one, version two, three, and four, and so on. When you're designing a uh, mobile app, you can have the initial screen here, screen two, screen three, screen four, and so on. So it really depends on what you're doing, but the artboards is a very, very useful feature. Oh, one other use when creating icons, you can have an artboard, right, for each icon. And you can have a whole grid of artboards, and each artboard will contain a single icon. Very useful for creating icon sets. So we can do a lot with artboards. Now, what about pages? Well, pages adds a whole different layer of organization to your sketch document. Now, at some point, when you're working with large documents, you'll find that uh, keeping all of your artboards in a single page can be inefficient. So you might want to create different pages. And different pages have different artboards. At any time, you can grab a couple of artboards from one page and put them in another. Just like that. Simply cut and paste. And this is very good for organization. As I mentioned previously, maybe you have the home page on page one. Maybe page two is the about page or the contact page of a website. And here you can have multiple artboards for different versions or even different elements. It's really up to you how you want to organize your work. Now, at any point, you can right click one of the pages and you can duplicate or delete it. And to add a new page, simply click on this button and rename your new page. If you want to hide these, like for example, if you're just working within a single page, you can simply uh, collapse this list and it's going to transform into a drop down. All right. So you can use pages and artboards to organize the content in your sketch document. But how do you organize the content within a page or an artboard? Well, for that, you can use layers and groups. And we'll learn more about those in the next lesson. When creating an element on the canvas or inside an artboard, a layer is automatically created for us in the layers panel. And that layer is basically a direct reference to a specific element on the canvas. And because we can rename layers and we can group them and we can move them up and down, it's really easy to organize our content this way. So let's learn more about this. As I was saying, if we're going to grab the rectangle tool and create a, a rectangle on our canvas, we can see that a layer is automatically created for us in the layers panel. If I click this, it will select the element on the canvas that it corresponds to. Now, with layers, we can rename them by double clicking or by right clicking on it and selecting a rename. I can also select multiple layers. So if I have, let's say, two more here, notice the two shapes that are automatically created. I can select these from the layers panel, or I can click on these individually on the canvas. And the, the thing with layers is that when you select two or more, you have alignment and distribution options right here in the top of the inspector. So first of all, these first ones are the distribution options. So you can distribute layers horizontally, or you can distribute them vertically. 
And actually, to understand these better, let's position them like this. So select them again, and let's distribute these horizontally. This will basically create the same distance between each layer. Very useful for when you have repeating elements, like in a menu, right? You need to have the same distance between each menu item. Well, this is one of the ways uh, you can do that very easily. The vertical distribution is the same thing when you have your layers sitting like this. You can select them and you can distribute them vertically. And when that happens, either horizontally or vertically, actually Sketch gives you a nice control here that you can use to increase or decrease the distance evenly across all elements. So it works in the other orientation as well. Just make sure you distribute them and you'll also have access to the same controls. Very, very handy. This way, you can change the distance between all the elements you selected all at once. You don't have to modify each element separately. This is a, actually a huge, huge time saver. Now, the recommended technique is to place those uh, layers inside artboard. So let's create an artboard here. And let's create a couple of layers, just some random uh, shapes here. I'm also going to use this triangle shape since I have it. And now I want to talk about a very useful feature in Sketch that's called Smart Guides. Now Smart Guides will actually show these uh, red and blue guides uh, telling you when you're aligning certain things. For example, these two items are now aligned. Now these two items, the rectangle and the circle, have their center axes, their horizontal axis aligned. And you can also see the distance in pixels between these elements. Very handy for when you want to make quick adjustments. So if I'm going to nudge this up, I can press Option on my keyboard, hover with my mouse cursor on a specific element, and then I will get measurements from the edges of my element to the element I'm hovering on. And this is actually super, super helpful. Let's try that with, the, with this uh, triangle. A very, very handy tool for when you want to make these fine, fine adjustments. Like you can leave your cursor on that shape and I can use the arrow keys to move this element to the desired position. How cool is that? Now with layers, you can use groups, which means you can group the layers basically. You can create a group out of a single layer by simply selecting it and hitting group or command G or right clicking and select group selection. So that created a group. Notice the uh, icon here has changed and we can now expand and collapse the contents of that group. And we can also bring in more elements to that group. And we can do that by going to the Layers panel, clicking on the layer and dragging it into that group. And then I can reorganize elements inside that group by simply dragging them. Or I can do this right from the beginning by selecting two or more elements. Right click, Group Selection. So now that created a group with the two elements that I selected. And groups, just like layers, can be renamed. They can be hidden or shown, and you can basically move them around. 
do all the things that you would normally do to a layer. And groups are very useful for, well, grouping elements. If, for example, you have a collection of elements that all belong to, let's say, a page header, then you would group all of those elements and call that group page header. Then when you want to find that group in the layers list, you can very easily do that by its name, or you can actually filter by name and you will find that immediately. Or you can click on that group and all or the entire group will be selected. So you don't have to select all of the elements individually. Very, very helpful. So that's how you can use layers and group to organize the content in your canvas or pages or artboards. Now, since uh, we're uh, speaking of elements, let's go ahead and create one and learn how to work with the various uh, types of uh, elements. We'll start in the next lesson with shapes and vectors. See you there. Any design starts with a simple shape, either a rectangle, a circle, or a hand-drawn shape. Well, in Sketch, you can start with those basic shapes, but you can also use more complex ones. And you can also draw your own using the vector tool. So uh, let's check these out. To create a shape, you would go to Insert, Shape, and you have a selection of shapes you can choose from a rectangle, oval, a rounded rectangle, line, arrow, triangle, star, and polygon. So creating one of these is really simple. Simply choose the one you like, for example, a rectangle, click and drag to your desired size. And that will automatically create a rectangle of that size. Uh, and it has this uh, default fill color and default border color. At any point, you can delete either the fill or the border, or you can add new ones. So for example, I can add another border on top of my existing one, and I can specify its position, either center, inside, outside, it really depends on what I want to do. And this is actually a really fast way of creating multiple borders in Sketch. Notice if I zoom in really close, I can now see my first border, which is positioned on the inside, and I can see my outer border, or my second border, which is positioned on the outside. You can change the border width using this box, border color changes from here and you also have some additional more advanced border options in this section below like the ends and the joins you can also create dotted borders by using the dash and gap options right here if at some point you decide oh i want to hide or delete a border you can simply uncheck and then click this little button, which will delete all unchecked properties. Same thing goes for fill. Only this time on the fill side, we have uh, some different options. For color, we can add a solid color, a gradient, a radial gradient, an angular gradient, or a pattern fill. And here we can add an image or a pattern either one that's predefined or we can add our own right here let's just stick with a solid color for now so that's how you can create a simple shape as i mentioned there are a couple of shapes you can choose from this was a rectangle but you can choose an oval tool and this will create either an ellipse or if you hold down shift while dragging it will make sure the width and height are the same so you draw a perfect circle then you have a rounded rectangle which is basically the same as this rectangle only by default it comes with a one radius right here and you can change the radius either by 
sliding this control or by entering a value manually in this box. You can also add lines using the line tool. So the line is basically just an element starting from point A to point B. Holding down shift will actually constrain that line to either zero degrees or 45 or 90 or just increments of that 45 degree value. So it's really easy to draw like a perfectly straight horizontal line or a perfectly straight vertical line or one that that's 45 degrees. You can also insert some more complex shapes like arrows, triangles, stars, and polygons. With the arrow tool, it's simply click and drag, just like you would with a line, only this is a more special line because you have a start and an end defined here, and you can choose from a variety of start and end points. So it's really easy to create these uh, more specialized lines. And it works the same uh, like with any other line. You can define its color by uh, changing the border value property. And if you add a fill to it, well, it doesn't do anything because it's a simple line. So fills don't really make sense here. Other types, you have a star, which you can draw like this, just like any other shape. And what's special about this is that you can define how many points you want to have in your star by using the slider or this uh, text box here. And you can also define the radius, right? So how sharp that star should be or how, I guess, blunt it should be. I'm not sure if that's the uh, correct term. And you can even turn this into a polygon if uh, you have uh, a minimum of three points and going uh, with the radius all the way to 100%. And speaking of polygons, you can also insert a polygon here. And again, you can define how many sides you want it to have. Four sides, it's a rhombus. Five sides, it's a pentagon, hexagon, heptagon, octagon, and so on and so forth. And this goes as many times as you want. Notice that our slider actually stops at 10, but we can enter higher numbers if we want to. So those are the default shapes that come with Sketch. Now, if you want, you can define your own shapes by hand drawing them with the vector tool. So the vector tool goes something like this. And let me actually get rid of all of these. So using the vector tool or V, you build a shape by defining a series of points. So if I do point A, point B, point C, and then I go back to point A, I've just created a triangle, and this is now a path. Now with the path, we can of course have control over the borders, and we can also add fill colors. And the area that's delimited by these lines will receive that uh, fill color, as you can see here. Now, the vector tool allows you to draw shapes that are not necessarily the same ones as we saw earlier. So instead of creating, uh, you know, rectangles with this, we can do some more interesting things. Like, for example, we can do this, and then we can do this. So on the second point, we click and drag, and we now have an arch. And then I can go here, and I can make that arch longer. I can go here. And I can close that. And now I have this path 
that I can use and of course add borders fills and so on and this is a custom path it's hand drawn using the vector tool at any point I can go into my path and edit each point individually all I got to do is simply double click and it takes me into edit mode and here I can take each point I can click on it I can move it around I can take each of these handles I can move it around I can make it shorter I can make it longer so it's really easy to refine a shape with um, with these controls and you can move these points either with your mouse or with your keyboard here I'm just nudging one pixel at a time using my arrow keys or I can hold down shift while pressing the arrow keys and it will nudge 10 pixels at a time right here in the inspector once we select one of these points we have some options for the point type so this right here is actually straight so you'll notice that those two handles for the angle are now gone and instead I just have a straight point or I can go back I can click this one which is disconnected I can modify these individually not in tandem with one another or I can click this one which is asymmetric notice it has a slightly different functionality than the one before I can click on a point let's say this one which is a straight point and I can modify its radius right see how that behaves and once I'm all done I can hit finish editing and now my shape is complete now one last thing before we wrap this up I mentioned in the beginning of this course that sketch is a vector based app so what does that mean compared to let's say Photoshop which is a raster based app well vector based means that what you draw in here is basically a vector so any shape you draw any vector you draw will retain its properties at any level of zoom so for example right now if I were to zoom in right here you can see everything is really really crisp the lines nothing is blurry everything looks great even the even the curves that I drew here right it's all super super smooth even the text let's add a little bit of text here notice if I zoom in really close everything is super sharp well that's what a vector based app does Photoshop on the other hand if you do this on a piece of text or on a shape it's gonna get blurry at some point because Photoshop is a raster based app it was made for editing photos not for you know creating user interfaces all right and that's a quick intro to using shapes and vectors in uh, sketch now because digital design is way more than just using shapes and it's also about using images and text let's um, learn how to work with these two elements in sketch and we'll do that in the next lesson so uh, see you there typography is the cornerstone of any design and no matter what you do you'll always use it sketch actually gives us a pretty good control over how the text will look like in the final product so let's go ahead and check that out and also learn how to work with images to create a text element in sketch you can uh, click insert text or use the shortcut t so t click anywhere on your canvas or artboard and start typing now sketch remembers the uh, last text properties that you used and it's gonna apply them here 
but at any point with the text layer selected you can go into the inspector and it can change its properties right here in the text panel so you can change the font face you can search for a specific uh, font family excuse me you can change the um, font weight and this will show you all the available weights for the fan font family you selected you can change the font size using this drop down here or you can slide it around then you can change the uh, character spacing right here right now it's set on auto but you can change that at any time then you uh, have the line height and this is automatically calculated by uh, sketch but you can change that manually by using this control and then you have the paragraph spacing here finally you can change the text color by using this control and for text color notice that we don't have those uh, crazy options for color that we have for example on a fill so we can't add gradients and such it's a simple solid color now since we're here let's talk a little bit about the color picker so besides the obvious color picker that we have here where you can define your hue and then you can choose the color that you want you can also change the text opacity by using the slider or the color opacity I should say this is the hex value and you also have an RGB value right here by default where you can change the values of red green blue by uh, directly and you can also use the slider on the bottom to control the opacity now you can hover this RGB value hit this little drop down icon and you can choose from another color format like HSB which is hue saturation brightness or HSL which is hue saturation luminescence so that's pretty handy right here we have uh, the option to use some predefined global colors or we can choose document colors so when you're working on a specific design you can define your color here then click the plus sign and that color will be added to your document colors and you can come back later at any point and reference that color for other elements you also have another view option here you can change from this uh, list type to a different list type where you can also see the hex value and you also have a color picker which you can click like this it's going to open up a loop and you can go around and uh, sample any color from your screen that is really really handy now coming back to the text options right here on the bottom we also have some alignment options so we have left aligned center right and justify here we have some resizing options so let's actually create a paragraph and test these things out now to create a paragraph let me add in some more text and we'll uh, change the text or the font size a little bit and then this is automatically generated the width of this text box is automatically generated but I can always grab this handle and I can resize it and I'm also gonna change the line height here a little bit so now we have a text box that spans on multiple lines notice the resizing changed here it's now set to auto height instead of auto width if I change this back to auto width it's gonna resize my text box to fit all the content horizontally if I do this I can then resize it like this or I can choose this option which is a fixed size 
and I can make my um, text box any size I want. So when I choose fixed sides, I also unlock the alignment here. So I can change my um, alignment, my paragraph alignment from left to center to right, or even to justify, which is this. And I also have the option to align my text to the top, to the center of my text box, or to the bottom of my text box. And then going back to any of these two sides will actually uh, lock or unlock some of these features. Like here, I can change the vertical alignment or the horizontal alignment, excuse me, while here, those are uh, pointless because the width of my text box is the width of my text. Now with text, <clears throat> we also have some additional options. If we click this, where it says adjust text options, it's just outside the, uh, the recording uh, portion here, but it says adjust text options. We get some additional information. For example, the text decoration, I can specify an underline or a strike through, and a text transform, which is uppercase, lowercase, or the uh, regular case that we specified. Now, Sketch also has some more advanced options for uh, working with text, options that you won't necessarily find in this inspector right here, but instead, you'll find when you go to the text menu item, right? So you can uh, choose bold italic underline. We have dedicated shortcuts for this for these here. You can make the text bigger or smaller using these um, key combinations here. Or we can also do text on path. And this is a very interesting technique. For example, let me remove this uh, strike through here. And let's draw a simple uh, vector like this, right? Uh, then I have to make sure that my path is below my text, right? I'm going to position this somewhere here. And then I'm going to select both and go text, text on path. So now I can, you know, change my path if I want to, like for example, change this. And you'll see that the text kind of uh, flows on my path. So that's, that's actually pretty, pretty cool. So that's just one of the things you can do with this. Uh, let's go back, let's delete this. And under text, we also have some uh, kerning options. If we're using a font family that uh, supports ligatures, we have the option to do that here as well. And then, you know, when we select a specific portion of the text, we also unlock some of these, like the baseline. You can choose to use superscript, subscript. So we really have um, some advanced functionality for, uh, for typography here. So that's pretty much it for text. Now, what about images? Well, working with images is super simple in Sketch. You can uh, import an image simply by going to Insert Image, and uh, that will uh, open up a uh, upload dialog where you can choose images from your computer. So here's an image that I downloaded from uh, Unsplash, and it just loads it up right here. This is a <laughs> quite a large image, so you can always resize it like this. And this creates an image layer that you can see right here. And on image layers, there are a few less options you would have compared to uh, other types of layers. Like uh, you can change the opacity here, of course, and you can add a fill if you want to. Maybe you can, uh, you know, you want to do something a bit more artistic. So you would add a fill on top of that image, adding this, in our example, uh, a very uh, a blue tint to it. You can do that. 
So you can use fills in conjunction to images. You can add borders, shadows, inner shadows, like let's add a shadow for example. So that creates a nice uh, photography effect. So that's one way you can load images. Another way would be to simply drag and drop from your computer. Like for example, here I have a finder opened and I can simply drag this image, drop it in, and it's gonna do the exact same thing. But using this approach will actually resize my image to fit the width of my artboard, which is great. All right, now there is another way to load images uh, in Sketch, and that is to set them as a background for a specific shape. So if I were to draw like a simple rectangle here, I can go into the fill, I can click the patterns, and I can hit images, choose image, and choose one from my computer. And that's gonna load it here, and actually the layer will act as a mask. So notice that when I resize this uh, shape that I created, it reveals the other parts of the image, or it resizes depending on uh, the size of my original image. So this is great because I can now go into the options and I can choose a radius. I can even do this by using the ellipse tool and I can create an image like this. So fills, go here, choose image. I can basically create this uh, round image. And then I have some other image options here. I can uh, change the display from fill to fit, to stretch, or to tile. Of course, if I were having a, a very small image that will tile it, it will repeat it all over uh, this shape here. And the shape actually can be one of these crazy hand-drawn shapes. It makes no difference whatsoever. So you can, again, go to fill, choose image, and you can now have uh, that image inside this uh, this shape right here. And finally, you can also add an image by simply doing a copy and paste function from uh, your computer. So you can go to the web, you can find an image, you can right-click, copy image, and paste it directly in Sketch. That works uh, just fine. Here, I just copied this image and I hit Command V or Paste inside Sketch. And it's doing the same thing as going to Insert Image and then uh, choosing the image from uh, my computer. Except in this case, it, uh, it loads it onto my canvas instead of my uh, artboard. But that's an easy fix. You just grab it and you put it in the artboard. So as you can see, there are lots of things you can do with images and text in Sketch. And the cool part is, all of it can be replicated in CSS. So you're not gonna um, get into a situation where you cr create this cool design in Sketch and you, you can't re replicate it in CSS. You can make it look exactly the same. Uh, with Photoshop, that was actually a problem because you would find these um, effects that you would add to, to certain elements. And when you got to CSS, well, you were like, well, how do I replicate this, <laughs> right? Because Photoshop was an uh, image manipulation, image editing software. So of course it had um, a lot more um, options or features you could add to elements. Uh, Sketch on the other hand, all the properties that you can apply here to text or images can be applied via CSS and that is fantastic. Now, um, Let's talk a little bit more about layers because they can actually do a lot more than I showed you previously. You can combine them in certain ways to achieve some more complex shapes. 
those are called Boolean operations, and we'll talk more about those in the next lesson. If you remember in lesson six about vectors and shapes, you saw that you can create custom shapes or hand-drawn shapes by uh, using the vector tool. But the thing is you can achieve much more precise and fast results by um, using something called Boolean operations. These are some layer operations that basically combine multiple shapes into a more complex one. So let's quickly check that out. The Boolean operations, there are four of them, can be found right here. They're called union, subtract, intersect, and difference. And I'm just going to jump straight into it and show you what they do. So I'm going to draw two shapes, two rectangles. I'm going to use some uh, simple fill colors. And then I'm going to bring these two shapes together like this. Okay? So now we have two shapes that are basically intersecting, they're overlapping each other. Now to access the Boolean operations, you must have two or more shapes selected. So let's start with Union. Union will basically take the shapes you selected and merge them into a single shape. Notice in the Layers panel, we now have a combined shape, but we also have access to the individual shapes. The fill color was borrowed from one of the shapes. And let's do a, an undo, right? It was borrowed from the bottom shape. So if I were to bring this up, you'll see that once we do the union, now it will be green. So the color of the combined shape will be uh, borrowed from the most bottom shape. So now we have a single shape that we can drag around, we can change its properties. It's just like any other shape. But at the same time, we have access to its founding shapes. So we can move these around, we can uh, change their uh, size, we can add a corner radius to this one if we want. But in the end, it's the same shape. So this is what union is doing. It's combining multiple shapes into a single one. It's merging them. Now, let's uh, come back here. And I'm going to select these two again. But this time, I'm going to choose subtract. So subtract will basically cut away one shape from the other. In this case, it cuts away the top shape from the bottom shape, right? So subtract, and now we're just left with this shape that has this cutaway corresponding to the shape that we just had here. And again, we have access to the underlying shapes, so we can uh, move this around at any point, and the uh, resulting shape will be updated automatically. That's pretty cool. If I were to change the order of the shapes, so if I were to put this one on the bottom, you'll notice that once we do subtract, we have a different shape, right? So it always subtracts the top shape from the bottom one. Now, intersect will create a shape that's the result of the intersection between these two shapes. So if I go back here, notice what part of these two shapes overlaps. It's this one right here. Well, this will be the result of intersect. And then finally, difference will create a shape that preserves the main shapes without the part that is intersecting. And it does this bit. This is now my shape. That's pretty cool, right? It's very straightforward. Now you'll get slightly different results when you have more than two shapes. Like for example, let's do this uh, with three circles. All right, so I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do this. Okay. Now if I combine these, 
union, I get a nice Mickey Mouse figure. And I actually have four of these. I accidentally uh, duplicated that one. So if I do subtract, yeah, uh, it only works with certain shapes, right? You'll see that these top shapes are subtracted from the one at the bottom. And if I were to make this larger, you'll see that uh, the result now updates. These two shapes are now subtracted from the bottom one. Uh, we can also do intersect and it's gonna be, well, nothing because these three shapes don't intersect each other. If I were to do this, then the intersect will get us this result here. But in this configuration, it doesn't work because this intersects with this and this intersects with this, but these two don't intersect each other. So the rules are uh, slightly different here. And finally, difference, just gonna remove the overlapping parts. All right, and that's a quick look at how to use Boolean operations. Um, if you want to learn more about this, then uh, check out the lesson notes where I've included a link to a free tutorial on how to use these Boolean operations in Sketch to design uh, an icon. Now, uh, a huge part of working with layers in Sketch is the resizing and constraining capabilities. And we'll learn more about those in the next lesson. See you there. I'm sure that by now the concept of responsive web design is very familiar. It basically boils down to how layouts adapt to the various devices they're being displayed on. Now Sketch actually has some very useful features that will help us with this. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about layer resizing and uh, layer constraints. So let's begin. To kick things off, I'm going to create a simple button, right? So I have a rectangle here. Let's make this a little bit bigger. And let's put a text inside it. And let's increase the font size a little bit. Let's align it to the center, group this up. And now we have a button. Now, let's say that we want to resize this button, right? So we'll select it. And let's say we want to make it smaller. Well, look what happens. The button background does get smaller but the text gets smaller as well, but it goes on multiple lines right now. And that's not something we wanna do. What we want is ideally keep this text in the center of my um, button here without resizing it. So how can we do that? Well, we gotta go inside the group, we have to select the text and we have to pay attention to this section here where it says resizing. So here we have a couple of controls. We have what is called pin to edge. And this basically means I can pin an object to a specific edge when we're resizing the parent. So in this case, if I'm gonna resize my button this way, notice that my text stays in the middle. But if I'm going to select it and I'm going to pin it to the top and I'm going to do that resizing again, notice that now my text stays pinned to the top and I can resize it from both directions and it's going to do the same thing. Same goes if I'm going to pin it to the bottom. Resize the parent and now the text stays at the bottom. And this is the same thing for when we want to pin it to an edge, like left or right. It's going to have the exact same behavior. And you can even see a preview of what that would look like here. But coming back to our problem, how do we keep this in the middle and not resize it? How do we keep the text the same size and in the middle? Well, we have to go here where it says fixed size. For now, this line in blue tells us that the fixed size is set vertically. So its height is fixed. 
Notice that when I'm resizing this, the height of the text box stays the same. Now, to keep the width fixed size, all I have to do is check this bit, the horizontal line, make it blue. So now my text box stays the exact same width. Now, these, what I just showed you here, are called layer constraints. All right, so you can add certain constraints to layers to affect their behavior when their parent is being resized. And there are uh, tons of uses for this uh, kind of behavior. For example, let's say that we have a typical header, right? I'm just going to quickly design something here. And I'm going to put a text here that says logo. And I'm going to put some menu items. Okay. So let's group these up. And let's put this right there. And now let's group these up. And now look at what happens when I resize my desktop. Well, Ideally, we would want this uh, header to expand its width or contract its width alongside my parent element, which is my artboard. So the way to achieve that is to select my rectangle. And I can say, pin to this edge, pin to this edge. And then I can select my group and do the same thing, pin to this edge and pin to this edge. So now when I resize my desktop, my background resizes as well. Now to fix the logo, make sure you check that and select fixed size here and also pin to the edge here and pin to the top, All right? So now if I resize my header, the logo stays in the correct place. We'll do the same for the menu items. We'll pin them to the right side this time and also to the top. And also these will have a fixed size. So now when I resize my desktop, notice that all the items stay where they should. The same goes for this. We still have a problem. We need to keep a fixed height on my uh, rectangle here. And also let's select a fixed, size, uh, fixed height on my main group. So now, let's say we still have a problem there. We have to pin this uh, main group to my desktop, to the top. So now it stays exactly where it should. So this is very helpful for when creating uh, responsive layouts because you can quickly resize some artboards and if you're doing the layer constraints properly, the elements will move by themselves to their correct position. You don't have to go into each artboard uh, and select each layer and move it independently. It all happens automatically using layer constraints. Now, the title of this lesson is also layer resizing. So let's quickly talk a little bit about that. You already saw me uh, using or resizing layers. It's really simple. Let's, uh, let's say this is a layer, right? The way to resize it is to grab any of these handles, either on the sides or on the corners, and drag them to their uh, new dimensions. You can hold down shift to scale them proportionally or to resize them proportionally. Or you can use the width and height properties from the inspector here on the right side. Now this lock here will basically make sure that the dimensions are proportional. See, so when I'm changing the, uh, the width here, the height changes automatically. But when I have this unchecked, the height can change independently 
from the width. Now, what's an interesting about this uh, inspector is that you can manually type the values, but you can also use some uh, keywords uh, to scale an element in different directions. For example, if I were to change the width here to 500, this will scale from the left side, right? But if I were to say 400R, it's going to scale from the right side. So the R stands for the right side. Uh, also, if I change the height, let's say to 400, this will change by default. It will scale from the top. But I can say, uh, for example, 300B for bottom, and it's going to scale from the bottom. So if I want to take 50 pixels off its height, but from this top part here, I can say um, minus 50, or actually it was 300, minus 50 bottom. Right, so it's going to take 50 pixels, but referencing the bottom part. And it can also uh, scale from the center or the middle, right? So we can say 400, or let's say 300, C for center. So that's going to remove or uh, scale from each side, left and right. Or you can say, for example, 200 middle, and it's going to uh, scale from the top and bottom. So that's pretty cool. Now to wrap this up, I want to quickly show you the difference between scaling and resizing. Because what we did here, this right here is called scale. All right, but we also uh, it's called uh, excuse me here it's called resizing, but we also have a scale option right here. So there is one big difference. The resize will only affect the width and the height of an element. The scale will also affect its stylistic elements, like stroke. So to give you an example, I will make this uh, border a little bit higher so we can see it. Let's say about 10 pixels, okay? So I'm going to duplicate this. So I'm going to resize this using the handles to about this big. But then I'm going to select the same element and I'm going to scale it uh, until its width is 331. So scale 331 and hit OK. So these actually have the same height. The only difference is by using scale, we also affected this stroke or the border width. See, now it's 22.52 width, while this one stayed at the original 10 pixels. So that's the, the main difference between resize and scale. Scale will also uh, resize a layer's property, and that means corner radius, border thickness, um, shadow size even, and it's going to do that automatically. All right, and... That concludes this chapter about Sketch Fundamentals, but we're not done yet because Sketch is a very complex piece of software. So starting in the next lesson, we're going to learn about shared styles, which is um, one of the uh, key features in this app and a huge time saver. So I will see you in the next lesson. A big part of Sketch is the reusability system, which means that for a more efficient workflow, you can reuse certain elements and styles and also have systems in place that allow you to change these elements and styles across pages and artboards at the same time. One of these systems is called shared styles, and this is what we'll cover in this lesson. So let's begin. Shared styles are applied to shapes. So if we were to create a simple shape, it doesn't matter what shape it is. It can be a rectangle, it can be a custom shape drawn with the vector tool. Okay, shared styles apply to all of these. Let's say that we're going to apply a fill color, 
and we're also going to apply a border color okay something like this it's a very very crude example and let's say that we also want to apply um i don't know a shadow and we want to save this layer style or this shape style so we can use it later well we can do that by going to the appearance section in the inspector where it says no layer style we can click this and select create new layer style we can give it a name for example my rectangle and it shows us a preview right here and the name so now i can select any other shape i want and i can go in here under appearance and i can select my rectangle so i can do that here i can create a new page and i can create a new element here and under appearance i can choose that style it works without problems but now let's say that i want to make some changes i want to change this fill color from this um, light blue to this uh, kind of magenta color well once i do that notice that only the element that i apply these changes to will actually display them the others stay exactly the same but we also have a small asterisk here next to the style name that means that this style has had changes was changed was updated it doesn't show the asterisk here on the other instances only on the one that was changed so now i have two options i can either uh, use this override or this particular style on this element only and ignore the rest or i can go in here and i can update the layer style and when i do that all of the other elements that use that shared style will get updated how cool is that now if at some point i decide okay i want this style but i just want the initial look of it i'll make my changes afterwards we can go in here select the element go to this bit and select detach from layer style so that will what that will do is it will basically keep the same appearance but detach it or unlink it from the layer style so now i can go in here i can change this color or this border i'm going to make it smaller or thinner and i'm going to update it so now only this and this will uh, get the updated style this one stays exactly the same because it's not linked to anything i can relink it by selecting it and choosing the layer style again now if i'm going to make some changes to this and decide that at some point okay i don't want those changes anymore i can go in here and i can select reset layer style and this will take it back to the shared style that i have applied previously now if i have more than one layer styles for example let's duplicate this let's change its color and let's save it as a new layer style let's call it my rectangle 2. see now i have two two styles i can always go and organize them by clicking this button where it says layer styles i can double click to rename and also i can delete any layer style i want using this button here so this is a very useful system uh, especially for collaboration because you might have one document that contains the styles for all your buttons icons uh, images even anything that can have a shared style applied to it right and then you can reference those styles and uh, include them in the rest of your project and when you have to make a change you just change one single item 
and then go and select update layer style and that will update all the elements that use that style across your entire document that is fantastic a huge huge time saver and one that i actually find myself using a lot now the styles that are saved or the properties that are saved in a layer style are all the properties that you can set here basically the opacity let's reset that right so the opacity makes a change the fill border shadow inner shadow if you decide to add an inner shadow that's going to affect it and also the blur affects the layer style as well all right so that's how you can use shared styles and these are applicable to shapes but what about text well for text we actually have text styles that work exactly the same way except they're dedicated for text let's have a look at those in the next lesson text styles allow you to define presets for text properties like color font family font size and so on they work similar to the uh, shared styles we covered in the previous lesson except they're just for text so let's uh, see how they work let's create a simple uh, text element and let's change its font size and let's add a nice color to it now if i want to save all of these properties that i set here so we can use them later on different text elements we can go in here under appearance where it says no text style create new text style give it a name let's say h1 now we get a preview right here and then i can create something else let's say hello and let's actually make this a little bit smaller and i'm just going to change its properties here somewhat and then if we decide okay well i want this piece of text to be an h1 to have the exact same characteristics i can go in here and i can click h1 and sketch will automatically apply the saved set of properties to this element as well and again similar to the shared styles if i'm going to change something here like for example the uh, font family again we have that asterisk and then we can go in and hit and hit update text style and those changes will be propagated to the uh, rest of the elements that use that that text style so what properties affect a text style well first of all it's the font family then it's the font weight then it's the font size then it's the letter spacing so basically all of these line height paragraph spacing and then the uh, text alignment will also affect the uh, text style but not this uh, these resizing properties these will not affect it right so as you can see i can change these at will but this here will not be changed in fact i can you know make this a very large text box like this but this will stay the same right so this is not affected but if i change the alignment here or the vertical alignment that will also affect the uh, text style so just be careful about that uh, apart from those text decoration also affects the style and also text transform the rest if for example we're going to take this layer and we're going to add a fill to it and we do an update we can see that the fill is also considered a style here that can be applied and we can also add a border to the actual text and that will also 
be applied. Shadows also trigger the uh, update mechanism and also inner shadow and blur. So as you can see, this is not uh, exclusively for text properties. Uh, text styles use other properties as well, but these text styles can only be applied to text. So I hope that makes sense. And again, just like the uh, shared styles we covered previously, these are very helpful for when you're defining uh, styles for elements you want to reuse, like headings or paragraph styles or uh, button text styles, right? You define them once, then you, you reuse them in the rest of your document. And then when and if you have to change something, you, ju you just uh, change it in one place, update the style, and uh, all the other elements that use that particular text style will be updated. So that's, uh, that's very cool. That's a huge, huge time saver. Now, um, we saw how to define these shared styles and text styles separately, but Sketch actually gives us a way to uh, combine these two and to define something called symbols, which are basically collections of elements and text styles. Let's uh, learn more about symbols in the next lesson. I think one of the most amazing features in Sketch is represented by symbols. Uh, these are repeatable elements that function in a master slash instance system. That means you can have a master component and then you can have instances of that component. So let's take a look at symbols and learn how they work. The best example or the simplest example I can give you for uh, using a symbol is to create a button. So let's create a simple uh, shape here and we'll put some text inside that says uh, submit. Okay, let's do uh, just a quick styling here. All right, so all I did was um, just set a fill color, a border color to this um, background and give it a large radius and also set some font family, font weight, size and color to this, uh, to this text. All right, now we're going to group this and we're going to, we can right click it and say create symbol or we can uh, hit this little button here where it says convert layers into a reusable symbol. Now we can rename this, we'll call it button, and we have the option to send it to the symbols page or not. But checking this will create an additional page here called symbols that will contain all the symbols in your document. So let's keep it checked, hit OK. Now if we check the page, we have an artboard with the name of our symbol and an instance in here. Now, here's where it gets interesting with symbols. Let's say I have another page in here. Let's create a, an artboard. And let's say I want to use that button. Well, I could go to insert where it says symbols, document, select button, and then just click it anywhere on the page. So now this bit is an instance of my button symbol. And you can see this icon here represents a symbol. And if we look in the inspector where it says symbol, right, we can see that button is selected. So now if I go into my symbols page, and this is the master component, okay? If I change, for example, the color of this text to, let's say, a dark gray, and I go back into my pages, you'll see that all of the instances of that symbol have been changed. Now, I can't do the reverse. That means go into one of my instances and select the text. 
It doesn't work like that. I don't have access to this. What I can do is change the text itself, but not its properties. So I can say here, submit form, All right? So if I do this, my master component is not changed and the other instance is not changed either. Only this instance has a different text. The only way to edit the style of this instance is to, re is to um, detach it from the symbol entirely. So we would have to do right click, detach from symbol, or we would go into here and say detach from symbol. So now it's just a simple group. I have access to all of its elements. I can change the color of this text to whatever I want. But that doing that will not affect the other instance of my symbol or the symbol itself. So that's how symbols work, basically. They're repeatable elements that function in this master instance system. Now, when I select a symbol, or when I select the master component in my symbols page, I have the option to manage the overrides, right? I can choose to allow overrides or not. So if I don't allow overrides, I cannot go into this instance and change the text. It's not available for me anymore. But if I do allow overrides, I can select my instance and I have another section here in the inspector called overrides. So I can change the text like this or I can double click that text and edit that element directly. So that's how overrides work. And you can have as many overrides as you want in here. Like for example, I can create a form, right? And we're, we're just gonna assume that these are the uh, form uh, fields. And I can create a symbol out of those. We'll call it form. So now this becomes an instance. My master is right here. And I can manage which overrides I want to allow. If I allow all of them, well, I can simply go into this instance and I can override each one. Just like that. Or I can double click each one and edit it that way. So this is huge. This is very, very handy because you can have like a master button, let's say, and instead of, um, you know, creating multiple buttons and repeating the process, you just create a symbol and you just change the text on each one. And if at some point you decide, okay, I want the text on the symbol to be this color, well, you would do that and that would be updated automatically on all the buttons. Now you can also have nested symbols, okay? So for example, if I'm gonna insert a button here and on that button, I'm gonna add an icon And just bear with me here. This icon is a symbol that I have in a library. We'll talk about that in the next lesson. But for now, right, this is a symbol. And I'm putting a symbol inside another symbol. So now I can override that symbol with another one. Right now, I can choose another one from my uh, linked libraries. and it's super easy to do. Now, as I was saying in the previous lesson, a symbol is not just about grouping elements together. You can also include text styles 
and, and uh, shared styles in a symbol. So let's keep things simple. Let's remove this. And let's select this rectangle, create a new layer style for it. We'll call it button BG. And let's select this text, create a new text style. Let's call it button text. Okay, so now if I'm gonna create a text, for example, that has the same style as my button text, and I make a change to it, let's say I change the font weight, and I update that, you'll see that the text inside my button, inside my symbol, will be updated automatically. Same thing goes for the shared style. If I'm gonna have a shape with the same style and I do an update to it, let's say I'm gonna make the border a lot thicker and I'm gonna update that, you'll see that the symbol gets updated automatically because inside the symbol, I have a layer which uses a shared style. It's really very, very simple and it's very customizable, right? You can organize your styles and you can do all sorts of things with um, text and layer properties. Now, previously, I showed you how to include those icons in my symbol. That's actually a bit of a more advanced functionality. Uh, that's called libraries or shared libraries. And libraries in Sketch are basically collections of symbols. And uh, we'll discover more about those in the next lesson. See you there. Sketch libraries are collections of symbols that can be shared with your team and can be accessed um, from any Sketch document. And because of these, they represent a key component to any design system or pattern library you might have. So let's see how to work with them and how you can create your own. Now, this is the document that I've been working on uh, for the past few lessons. And uh, if we take a look in uh, our symbols page, we have these uh, two symbols defined. Now, what I'm gonna do to demonstrate uh, what libraries can do is save this document. And I'm gonna save it in a random folder on my desktop. I'm gonna call it demo library. And then what I'm gonna do is create a new document, a new sketch document. And inside my first page, I'm gonna create an artboard. Okay, now let's say I wanna use the elements from my library into this one. Well, I could go in here and I can try to copy this bit and paste it in here and it works. It creates a symbol, but this symbol is just a standalone symbol in my document. It's not connected to anything. So what we need to do is go to the sketch preferences, go to libraries, and sketch already has this library built in. It's called Apple iOS UI design resources. And you can download and use this, or you can add your own library. So hit this button, Navigate to the folder that um, we saved the library to, load our demo library, and make sure it's checked right here. Now we can close the preferences, and we can go to insert, and where it says here symbols, you can see that we now have a couple of libraries we can choose from. So demo library, button, and let's put it in here. So now this has a different icon and this icon tells us that this symbol is linked to a library and it's the library that we created here. So now I can go in here, I can, for example, select my layer and I can change its border color. Let's make it green. I'm gonna save that, that's important, and then I'm gonna navigate back to my document. And here, immediately we see library updates available. We click this and it shows us 
hey, some components are outdated. So it shows us the old version and the new version. At this point, I can decide not to do anything and keep the current version, which is magenta, or I can update to receive the new style. Other than that, this symbol is just like any other symbol in my page. I can choose to unlink it from the library. I can replace it with something else. I can detach it from the symbol. Or I can open it in the library directly. And that's going to open up my, um, my library here in Sketch. Now, I can also do overrides. So I can double click this text. I can edit it or I can edit uh, that right here. And also, uh, here's a cool part about libraries and shared styles, text styles and symbols. When you have a shared style or a text style inside a symbol, you get overrides for it. Right, so right now, if I would have had another uh, text style here, I would have the option to replace it. Same goes for the demo style, for the uh, shared style, right? I have another button BG style that I can use. And look, I can do that. That's an override. And all of these styles are not defined in my document they are defined back in my library document here. And this actually doesn't even need to be opened. It doesn't matter. Once I loaded that library here in the sketch preferences, that's always available. So unless the file, the library file gets deleted, I'll always have access to the symbols and styles saved in that file. That is just fantastic. Now, this is useful in a number of different ways. First of all, you can use this system, this library system to create your own design system, right? You can have all of your styles, all of your symbols in a single place, and everybody on your team can use it. And if at point at some point you are going to make a change, you're going to change the library and all the people that are using that library will get the new elements or the new um, styles. They'll basically be kept up to date at all times. So that's fantastic. Another great use for it, and this is something that I actually use all the time, is that you can put assets like icons in separate libraries and then use them in your projects. So in my sketch document, I have two icon sets, ion icons and zond icons, that I saved as sketch files. Okay, let me show this in the finder. That's all there is to it. It's a sketch document with a bunch of artboards, and inside each artboard is an icon. And that icon actually has a... Um, a mask here so that we can uh, edit the color at all times. So once I have those loaded, if I want an icon, I can simply go to insert and I can choose my library and I can grab any icon I want from here. For example, this box icon. And now we can see that it's linked to that uh, Zond icons library. That is super cool. And that's a quick look at sketch libraries. Now, if you want to learn more about this, uh, check out the lesson notes where I've included a, a link to a tutorial that uh, explains this feature in more detail. Now, let's talk about prototyping because that's also a huge feature in sketch. We'll do that in the next lesson. See you there. When creating websites or web apps or even mobile apps, uh, prototyping is the process that allows you to create an interactive mock-up of your project. And this is very useful for uh, when you want to create or to simulate like a regular user workflow 
or for when you want to present your uh, project to a client. So let's uh, see how we can create these prototypes in Sketch. Here I have a demo document set up where I've uh, included some artboards from a UI kit I got from Envato Elements. Uh, you can find the link to that kit in the uh, lesson notes. But this is what your uh, typical mobile app could look like, right? You have multiple artboards, each one for a specific screen of your app. And when you're, for example, presenting this uh, project to a client, you want to show him that, look, when you click the next button, it's going to take you to this screen. Click the next here, it's going to take you to this screen. Or when you uh, click or tap the uh, skip button, it's going to take you to the uh, main screen, which is play music, right? So in Sketch, it's actually really easy to simulate this kind of behavior. What you need to do is select the element that you want to uh, behave as a trigger. And right here, where it says prototyping, you hit the plus sign that says add new link to layer. And then you hover over the artboard that you want to jump to. In my case, I want to go to the second artboard. And that's it. See this um, orange line? That's where it tells you that, hey, by clicking this next button in prototyping mode, you're taken to intro 02. And you can do the same for the other artboards. Select the element. You can uh, go to prototyping and select add link to artboard. It does exactly the same thing. Or you can just press W and then select the next artboard. And so on. You can do this W, select this one. And here, this is an album view. So maybe we'll uh, tap that element and it's going to take it to this album. And then we can also select the skip. It's going to take me to play music. Skip here. It's going to take me to play music. And skip here. It's going to take me to play music. All right. So that's how you can create a prototype by adding these links. Now you can also add hotspots. And to give you an example of that, we're going to pretend that this bit here is a hotspot. And this, when you tap it, it's going to take you to this album screen. So what we need to do is create a link. We're going to link it to the album music. So it says here, the target is now album music. And then we can hover on this layer on this sub button where it says create hotspot, create separate hotspot layer. So we're going to do that. Now this hotspot acts like a mask around our main layer. So I can actually hide my main layer, but the hotspot is still there. So whenever I'm going to tap or click inside that hotspot area, it's going to behave the same way. It's going to perform the same action, which is to take me to this album music. So with all said and done, let's actually hit preview. It's this button right here. And this allows you to preview prototypes. Now, we actually don't have a starting point set. So in my prototype, all I have is this um, play music artboard. But notice my hotspot area. It's where my cursor changes to the Mickey Mouse hand. So if I click that, it's going to take me to this artboard or this screen. Now to set a um, starting point, we need to select the first artboard and then go to prototyping, use artboard as start point. Notice we have a little flag here. So now, when I hit preview, it always starts with my uh, intro 01 artboard. So now if I hit next, it's going to take me to intro 02, intro 03, and then to play music. If I hit this, it's going to take me to the album cover. And by using this drop down, I can jump to any artboard I want. 
I can also set a different starting point. Like if I want play music to be my starting point, all I have to do is hit this little button and now this artboard adds as my starting point, regardless of what I have selected here. So if I select this and I hit preview, it still opens up my play music uh, artboard. And of course, if I uh, go to intro 01 and I hit skip, it takes me directly to my uh, play music artboard. Now, let's, uh, let's bring back this uh, layer here. And let's also add an action to this icon. This should take me back to play music. But let's do a different animation because notice by default, all our animations are animate from right. So every artboard comes in from the right side. Okay. But on this one, I want to change it. I want to animate the artboard from the left. So we're going to select that. And now you'll see that when I click this, the artboard comes in from the right side. And you have a couple of different options here. You can have the artboard come in from the bottom, the top, left or right, or you can have no animation at all. That's pretty cool. Now, there is one last thing I want to show you here, and that is fixed positioning. So you can select any element in your artboards and select fixed position when scrolling under prototyping. And that makes sure that when you're on a screen that's uh, smaller than the height of your content and you need to do scrolling, this element stays positioned like this. It stays in the same place. It's a fixed element just like you would uh, do in CSS. All right, so that's how you can create a prototype. Now, how do you present it? We'll find that out in the next lesson. There are multiple ways to preview a sketch prototype. And in this lesson, we'll uh, go through each one and see what it's all about. So uh, the first way, well, you've already seen it uh, in the previous lesson, and that is to preview directly in Sketch by using the preview button. Uh, this will open up your uh, uh, starting point artboard, but you can use this uh, drop down to navigate through each one. just like that. And you can also use it to set or remove uh, starting points. So if I want to remove this one from the play music, I just do that. And if I want to set it to the intro, I just do that. It's really, really simple. Now, the second way is to use Sketch Cloud. Sketch Cloud is a service that you have included with your uh, Sketch subscription. So you can click this button you will sign in with your Sketch account, okay? And once you're logged in, uh, you click this button again, Upload to Sketch Cloud, Upload Document. And you can see here that uploads are private. So let's do that. And that opens up a link in Sketch Cloud. And you can see the uh, document pages right here. You can click on each one. You can see Preview. And you can also use this... Uh, page to collaborate with others, add a discussion and talk about this. And you also have a prototype section that you can click and it's going to load that prototype. And you can navigate through it just like you would, um, just like I showed you in Sketch. Uh, it's looking a little bit weird here because uh, the background color of the artboards is not included. But other than that, the functionality is exactly the same. So that's method number two for presenting a prototype. Now, the cool thing about this approach by using Sketch Cloud is that you can uh, share this prototype with others, right? You can add more people here, team members or even clients, and they can view that prototype online at any time. That's pretty cool. Now, the third way to present a prototype is with an app called Sketch Mirror. Now, Sketch Mirror is an iOS app, okay? 
So I have my uh, iPhone here. And I'm going to open up Mirror. Now, the, the trick about this working is that you need to connect your phone and the computer that's running Sketch on the same Wi-Fi network, OK? So in my case, let me just quickly check. It is uh, on the same Wi-Fi, and my phone is on the same Wi-Fi. So now in Sketch, I have a, um, a little button here, button here that says Connect iPhone. So I'm going to click that, and right away, it tells me I have a Sketch document open on Adi's uh, computer, and then I have all of my pages here. I'm not sure if you can see this properly. I have all my pages. I can open any of them and I can navigate through them just like I would on um, my normal prototype, just like we were doing on the uh, on the computer. So that's pretty cool here. Here's the album cover. Here's the back button. There we go. So that's a nice way of, you know, previewing a mobile app directly on your phone because you can see the entire screen, especially if you're uh, designing it at the uh, correct screen size. You can uh, go through it, go through the app, just like you would the real thing. And that is very, very good. Now, that's how you can create and preview prototypes in Sketch. Now, prototyping is mostly a collaborative process, right? You need to have a team with you um, to, uh, to showcase these things or even clients. And speaking of collaboration, Sketch is actually giving us a lot of options to make that process a lot easier. And we're st we'll start to exploring those uh, in the next chapter. And in the next lesson, we'll talk about exporting assets from Sketch. So I'll see you there. When designing in Sketch, at some point you'll want to export certain elements or even code. That is super simple to do, so let's check it out. Uh, there are a couple of different ways you can um, export elements from Sketch. The first way is to create slices. To create a slice, you would go to Insert, Slice, or press S on the keyboard, and then just um, create a slice, just like you would maybe with a, with a knife, over the area that you want to export. You can give it a name, and you can see a separate layer created here, okay? With with this icon, that is a slice. And you can also see a preview of it in the inspector. It's the way it's gonna be uh, exported. Here, you have the exporting options. You can specify the size. You can choose whether or not to add a prefix or a suffix. And you can choose the export format. For the formats, we have PNG, which exports with transparency, JPEG, TIFF, WebP, PDF, EPS, and SVG. Personally, I find myself uh, using the SVG format in most situations for UI elements, uh, but I also export in JPEG or WebP for images. It really depends on the project. So once that's all said and done, you can hit Export Selected, and that will export the image that you selected right here as a PNG file. Now, you can also add multiple export options by clicking this plus sign. So here you can specify, okay, I want a 2x size as well. You can add a prefix, and let's say I want an SVG this time, or let's say a JPEG. Maybe I want an SVG as well. I can do that. 
and I can remove the prefix. So when I hit export selected again, hit export, overwrite, you'll see that now Sketch has exported my initial PNG, the SVG, and also a 2x JPEG image. Apart from that, on slices, you also have the option to trim the transparent pixels, or you can add a background color behind the element that you uh, sliced here. Now, if you don't want to click export selected for each slice, let's say that maybe you have uh, another slice, like, I know I'll just draw something randomly here, right? So now I have two slices and you wanna export them both. Well, you can click the big export button here on the, uh, on the toolbar and this will actually export everything. Slices, uh, items marked for export, artboards, all of it. And from here you can select or deselect the items that you want to export and you hit the export all or the export button. Now, another way to export an item is to mark it for export. So if, for example, I were to export this uh, button, right? I have the button here. I will select its group. I would go in the inspector and say, make exportable, right? And I would select my uh, options here, let's say an SVG, and you can see a preview. You can also uh, click this little um, icon and it's gonna give you some um, presets options. So you can choose from the default presets or you can choose from iOS or you can choose Android. Or if you define your own, you can then go in here and you can say create preset. You would give it a name and that will now be available right here. So then you could hit export selected and sketch will generate a bunch of folders with your uh, correct assets. And as I was saying previously, any items that are marked for export here will also appear in this big export uh, window that uh, shows up when you click the export button. Now, apart from exporting images like this, you can also export entire artboards. You can click on each individual artboard or you can select multiple artboards, make sure they're exportable. And just like previously, you can select the format that you want. In addition to that, Sketch has an option that allows you to export all artboards as a PDF. You would go to File, Export Artboards to PDF. And that will generate a PDF file with all of your artboards. Just like that. Now, Sketch is not just for exporting images. You can also export code with it. More specifically, CSS attributes and SVG code. So if you take a look at this gradient here, you can right click it and you can say copy CSS attributes. So let me move this up a little bit so you can see it, right? Copy CSS attributes. So once those are copied, if you open up a um, code editor and you would paste that in, you will see the CSS code that's generated a linear gradient. But you can also copy like maybe text information, like maybe this one, copy CSS attributes. And it's gonna give you a lot of information like the font family, size, color, letter spacing, and text align. How cool is that? Apart from that, you can also uh, copy SVG code. So let's take this icon, for example. If you want to export this as an SVG and get its code, um, you can export it here normally. Like, let's do that right now. 
So we have this uh, SVG file. Where are you? Uh, music. And you can then open that in a code editor. And you would get this SVG code. Or you can go back into Sketch and oops let's uh, move this away from now we can right click it copy svg code and then you can paste it in here in a code editor and it's exactly the same thing but this is the the faster way so this is a huge help uh for developers because uh they can you know apart from generating this svg code quickly they can um, you know go into for example this background and say okay well what colors are these how can i replicate it in css well just right click copy css attributes go back in paste that in and they already have the css code written for them along with all the color values they need they don't have to then you know sample each color write this bit by hand it's a huge huge help so that's how you can export um, images and code from sketch now probably the best feature for collaboration is sketch cloud and sketch for teams and we'll have a quick look at those in the next lesson sketch cloud is a service that allows you to upload documents in a private cloud and then share them with other people, your team members, or even your clients. Um, now, this also powers something called Sketch for Teams, which is a brand new feature at the time of this recording. So let's check these out and see what they're all about. To use Sketch Cloud, you need either a personal license, so you need to buy Sketch, or uh, you need an active trial that's running. Uh, once you have that, uh, you can sign into your uh, uh, Sketch account, and when you hit Cloud, uh, you'll have the option to upload a document to the cloud. So let's actually do that. Let's create a new document here, and we're going to say hello. Now, I'm going to hit Cloud, Upload Document, and this opens up a browser window that shows me my document. And I can open each artboard and I can see what it's all about. And then on the right side, I can see my activity. So if other people are invited to this um, project, they can comment and they can leave feedback right here. Now, by default, any upload you make to the cloud is private. Okay. If you want to invite other people, you'll click this little button, you enter the email address of the person you want to add, and you set their permissions. So what can the new people do? They can comment, they can download, or they can use that document as a sketch library. And then on the top, you also have share settings. So you can determine who has access or who can view this document, the people you've invited or anyone with the link and the people you've invited. So if you go back to Sketch and you click on Cloud, there's a link here. And if you choose this option, anyone that has that link has access to that document. Otherwise, only the people you invite here using the, their email addresses will have access uh, to that document. Now, that's Sketch Cloud in a nutshell. Sketch for Teams is designed to work with Sketch Cloud uh, to create a personal or a team workspace with your team members. Okay, so if we go back to the um, to the Sketch Cloud homepage, under Personal, you'll find a link called Create New Team. So let's see here, Team Adi. You can choose a logo if uh, you want, and here you can choose uh, the plan that you want to pay for. It's basically a 25 or $9 per month, depending on the uh, the plan you choose, either you pay yearly or monthly, and this is paid per contributor. Okay, so with sketch for teams, 
it's much easier to determine what people are on your team. Like if you have multiple contributors with something like this, you can say, okay, you, you, and you are members of my team. So when you upload a document then from Sketch, you'll have the option to uh, upload it to your personal space or to your team workspace. Now, Sketch for Teams is still currently in beta. So if you're uh, using this, or if you're gonna use this and find some bugs here and there, please be patient. Uh, the, uh, the team behind Sketch is uh, hard at work. But it's a welcome addition and uh, one that's gonna make collaborating very, very easy. All right, and those are the collaboration tools you can use in Sketch. Now, the final chapter of this course is dedicated to plugins because these will add a whole different level of uh, functionality to the app. Uh, we'll uh, start exploring these in the next lesson. See you there. Sketch plugins will basically add extra functionality to the app. And uh, there are a lot of them, a lot of plugins. And this is one of the things that I love about Sketch, the huge developer community behind it that's constantly um, producing these plugins and offering them for free. Um, chances are, if there's a certain functionality that you would like to see in Sketch but isn't there natively, there is a plugin there somewhere that's going to do that for you. Now, let's uh, take a look at these plugins and see how they work. To open the plugin repository, you would go to the plugins menu item, manage plugins. Here you can see plugins that are already installed in your system. And I have two of them here. I'll show them to you in just a little bit. But if you want to get more, click this button, get plugins. And that's going to open the repository, the official repository from the Sketch website. And here, if we uh, just uh, take a quick look, there are a lot of them. I don't know the exact number, but there are a lot of them. Now to install one of these plugins, well, you just uh, open it. It usually opens up in the, uh, in the GitHub page and you just follow the instructions here. But usually uh, there is a uh, plugin file, which you just double click and you install it. In other situations, you might go to uh, plugins to reveal the uh, plugins folder and then copy the contents there. Now, let me show you how to work with a plugin. Well, it depends from plugin to plugin, but you have an entry here in the plugins menu and you would go there. Let's cl click on Envato Elements. Uh, this is a new plugin that came out from Envato. It basically allows you to get uh, assets from Envato Elements directly in Sketch. Uh, if you want to learn more about this plugin, uh, check out the lesson notes. Uh, there are some uh, great resources there. So let's say I want to, I don't know, get a photo. I can basically browse through all of these. I can search. Let's say I want food photos. Right. And then I can click on a specific photo. And if you're not a subscriber, it's going to tell you get started. And uh, what you need to do is generate an Envato Elements extension token. So let me do that really quick. And then it's uh, back to image. So now I can uh, enter my project title here. Let's say Tuts Plus, download and license this image. Okay, so now our image is imported in Sketch and we can use it right away. And apart from that, uh, there are a lot more assets you can get from here, website UI kits, mobile UI kits, photos. So it's really easier to use than going to Elements, to the Elements website, downloading them from there, and then importing them uh, into Sketch. All right, and that's it for plugins. Um, the plugins you download and use are really up to you and what kind of workflow you have and what you're trying to do. Um, but for me personally, Envato Elements is uh, one of my top plugins because 
I can find a lot of assets there. And because I'm a subscriber, I can get them and any, at any time directly in Sketch. So that's a, that's a huge time saver for me. I've also included a link in the lesson notes on a, on a slightly older tutorial that I made on my uh, top five uh, Sketch plugins. So make sure you check that out. And in the end, check out the Sketch repository that I showed you. There are so many plugins there you can choose from. And um, there are some ones that uh, really help you a lot and uh, make you more efficient. So check that out and choose the plugins that work best uh, for you. Now, finally, before we wrap up this course, I want to uh, go over one last thing, and that is sketch data. Fantastic feature. I'll tell you all about it in the next lesson. In this final lesson of the course, we're going to take a quick look at um, sketch data, which is a relatively new functionality. It was added, I believe, in... Uh, Sketch 52, and it sort of behaves like a plugin in the sense that it allows you to add some extra functionality to Sketch. But Sketch Data basically gives you the option to add placeholder images and placeholder text to your document really fast. The cool part is you can bring in your own sources for the images and the text. So you're not uh, so it's not like using the regular placeholder uh, services with lorem ipsum or um, you know images of uh, cats or dogs, right? You can bring in your own images, and that makes it super convenient because you can define your own sets of content, text, names, whatever it is, and images, right? When you're developing websites, maybe you want, uh, and you have the same set of images that you use for your mockups, you can define those once, and then you can use sketch data to load them again and again and again, really easily, it saves you a bunch of time. So let's check it out. Sketch data is accessed from this button right here where it says data. And to make it work, let's create an artboard. And inside the artboard, let's create a shape. I'm just going to demonstrate this quickly. With the shape selected, you would go to data, for example, unsplash, and you can uh, choose to load a random photo or you can search for one. Let's search for one from the food category. So that loads this photo and it also tells you the author here. How cool is that? And this image is added as a background to this shape. Do you want another photo? Just hit a random photo in there, and it's going to give you a random photo. That's pretty cool. Now, data uses Unsplash as a source for the content, but it also uses uh, two other services for images, I mean, faces and tiles. So faces will basically give you a a random portrait and you can choose refresh data to just refresh that over and over and over again or you can use tiles which will give you a pattern and again you can refresh over and over now this also works for text so you have if i have a piece of text here and i want to add maybe a placeholder text, I can go to data, sketch data, and I can choose from two predefined sources, names and world cities. So this will just give me a random name again and again and again. Now, how do you add your own sources? Well, it's actually quite simple. You would go to sketch preferences, data, and here you can see the ones that are already loaded or you can add your own. So you hit add data and this will ask for a folder with images, for example. And I'm just going to choose a folder here, preview 02. Uh, this is one of the music kits that I was telling you about from Envato Elements. So now 
I can again create a shape and go to data preview 02. And that's going to load a random image from that kit. in my uh in my artboard here that is very very cool uh it goes the same way with text but instead of an image you would just create a folder with a text file in it and inside the text file you would list all the values that you want and they're going to be separated by a new line character so let's do that quickly I'm just going to uh, create a new file here and I'm going to say theme forest, graphic river and code canyon. And I'm going to save this as marketplaces.txt. Okay. So now we would go back to sketch, add data, marketplaces. And then if you have a piece of text, you can grab data from there there you go and it gives you a new value randomly and that's pretty much it for sketch data and in fact for this course it was quite a long course but i wanted to cover all the important bits and pieces so you'll have um, a pretty complete picture of what sketch is and what you can do with it uh, as i usually say practice is the best teacher so you know, go ahead and download Sketch. You can get a free 30-day 30 30 day, uh, trial for it, and you can play around with it as much as you want. And hopefully in that time, you'll uh, learn if it's for you, uh, if you like it, if you don't like it. Uh, but with that said, thank you very much for watching this course. I'm Adi Purdila, and until next time, take care.